Oh, she didn't have any sense. She'd been doing this for years. Plus, we raised some hoodlums of our own, so there's what I'm saying. Good morning, Unity family, those who are viewing us via Facebook, those who cannot be here with us. I know some of our folks uh, who are sick or traveling, they join us on, on these broadcasts, so welcome. We're glad that you're with us. We're glad we have visitors this morning. And thank you for bringing your kids. That's what we're all about. We love kids. We love children. That's the ministry that God has called Unity Baptist Church to. Obviously, we didn't set out to, to create a church that way, but it seems like God has brought us children, so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do one of the greatest evangelistic outreaches a church has in its calendar this coming weekend. Vacation Bible School is one of the, one of the premier places, one of the premier opportunities to share the gospel especially to those young people who need to know Jesus. Because the truth is, and the statistics show, that if people do not come to, the, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the time they're 18, the chances are they never will. That's a scary thing. It is vitally important. And just as Jesus taught, do not hinder the little children to come to me. God loves children. As a matter of fact, Jesus made a statement one time that shows just how much God the Father cherishes children. Jesus said, do not hinder the, the little children. He said, don't treat them that way. Don't you know their angels always see the face of my Father? It's Jesus' words. He didn't say your angels. He said the kids' angels, the children's angels. Don't you know they always see the face of my Father? Children are vitally important to God, and they should be vitally important to us. This is why we put such an emphasis on it. It's why we go through background checks before we're... We work with the kids. This is why we focus on the children. Most churches do not have kids. We got more kids than we got adults. We are blessed with them children. So I have nothing to do with the sermon today. I'm just saying. <laughs> that was the ADHD. I mean, I said, that's your freebie. We're going to continue looking at the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 specifically. But before we do that, would you... Join your hearts with me in prayer this morning. Father God, thank you so much for these who have gathered together in your name. What a wonderful day it is, Father, to be in your house with your people, to worship you, to praise you, to sing these beautiful songs, and to see these wonderful, precious children that you have brought to us. Father, we ask that you would allow us to have the words to impress their hearts. And Father, we just ask a special blessing upon them all. Help them to enjoy coming to your house, Father, and help them to learn the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask all of these things in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. We're going to continue looking at the book of Acts in chapter 8. Now, if you'll recall, we, we start in chapter 1 and we're going through the book of Acts and it may seem tedious to you, but there's a purpose behind it because the book of Acts is our history. The book of Acts tells us how we got here. It takes us from the the theology that we find in the Gospels to the doctrine that we find in the epistles in those letters of Paul and James and, and Jude and, and Peter and so on and so forth. That's doctrine is how we behave, right? Based on the truth of who Jesus is, now we behave a certain way. That's what our doctrine is. Acts takes us to that transition period. Luke does something very interesting beginning here in chapter 8. Most people don't understand it. Most people miss it because it's sort of subtle. But if you'll recall, we've heard the, the gospel preached in the book of Acts and thousands and hundreds have come to know Christ. The church is growing by leaps and bounds. Just remember last week, Philip, in response to the persecution that arose after Stephen's stoning, God sends him to Samaria. And he's having a thriving ministry in Samaria. People are coming to know Jesus. People are rejoicing. The church is growing by leaps and bounds. But yet we see here in chapter 8, right in the middle of this huge revival, right in the middle of this thriving ministry, said God, God says, Philip, I want you to leave this place and go out into the desert. Now, let's put, let's put ourselves in, in Philip's position. Now, wait a minute, God. I mean, don't you see what's going on? I mean, I'm being effective. People are coming to know Jesus right here. Why would you send me? Send somebody from Jerusalem. Send them apostles. They're doing nothing. They're sitting on their hind parts. Send them down there. They're closer. 
Why me? Because God had a purpose for Philip. God had prepared a meeting for Philip for years. And it was time for that meeting. Philip going to the desert. I admire Philip right here. He doesn't haggle. He doesn't quibble. He doesn't throw excuses. Verse 27 says, the angel says, arise and go. Verse 28 says, Philip goes. Not a quibble. Leaves his thriving ministry to share the gospel with one person. If you don't understand one single individual is important enough to God that he will move heaven and earth to share the gospel with them, to bring the gospel to them, then you don't know our God. Jesus would have died on that cross if only one person in all of history accepted his sacrifice. That's how much people mean to God. They need to mean that much to us because we're God's children, because we recognize what God bought us from. We recognize the great blessing and grace that he gave us. We must extend that outward. So read with me, if you would, chapter 8, beginning in verse 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Arise and go to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the e e Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent. <coughs> so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this, this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and both men went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw no more, saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azostus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. As I said, Luke is doing something very interesting here in chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. Does anybody recall who the sons of, of Noah were? Remember, Noah took his three sons onto the ark with him. All of mankind descends from Noah's three sons. Anybody remember who they were? They were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Right? Here in chapter 9, we see the gospel coming to an individual, a son of Ham. Chapter, uh, chapter 8. Chapter 9, we see the gospel coming to an individual, the Apostle Paul. If you're wondering why, why the focus switches from the gospel being shared with these great crowds to the gospel being shared to individuals, it's because Luke is trying to get this point across. As a matter of fact, God is trying to get this point across through Luke. Remember when Jesus had told the apostles he wants to spread the gospel to the entire world, and yet they're still in Jerusalem. They're still just primarily speaking to the Jews. God had to use the persecution, the stoning of Stephen and the subsequent persecution to even prompt him to get out into Samaria, which is right next to Jerusalem. That's just a day's walk. They have yet to take it to the world. So God brings the world to them. Chapter 8, we see the gospel coming to a son of Ham. Chapter 9, we see the gospel coming to a son of Shem. In chapter 10, we see the gospel coming to a son of Japheth in the Roman centurion, Cornelius. Cornelius, the Roman centurion. God wants the gospel to go out into the whole world. That's who we are, Southern Baptists. We're going to start talking about the, 
the Lottie Moon Christ Christmas offering very shortly. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering is how Southern Baptists support missionaries. As of July 31st of this year, we have 3,635 missionaries, Southern Baptist missionaries that we support around the world, ministering to 247 people groups. They're not on the payroll. Well, yeah, they're on the payroll, but it's only through our giving in Lottie Moon. Southern Baptist churches all over the world will be gathering a Lottie Moon offering. I hope you, you plan on setting aside just a little bit of what you were going to spend on Christmas presents. To remember that this is the calling of the church. Matter of fact, William Carey is called the founder or the father of modern missions. William Carey was a, born to a poor family in 1761 England. Father apprenticed him out to be a shoemaker when he was a young teen. He was earning his living as a shoemaker until he met Jesus when he was 18. He continued doing making shoes, but then he started preaching in small little Baptist churches all over England. And the longer he studied the Scripture, the more he understood that the primary calling of the church was to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, that may not seem revolutionary to us. 1761 it was. The prevailing thought then was that that was a command given to the apostles. They had already done it. The heathens had rejected the gospel, so they just have to wait the judgment day. Matter of fact, he started sharing his ideas and he's, and he's, preachers have meetings. We get together, other preachers. You know, and we don't talk about you. No. And he started sharing his ideas in these meetings. Matter of fact, one of the, he, he, he records that one time he shared the idea that maybe we should go out from the pews, that maybe we should get out of the building and share the gospel. Specifically, go into the to the outermost, outermost parts of the earth and share the gospel. And a minister stood up and said, young man, sit down. When God pleases to, to save the heathen, he will do so without my or your help. He had to fight some battles to take the gospel overseas. It wasn't on the church's radar back then. Now, William Carey, if, long story short, he decided to go to India. He was going to share the gospel. When he said, I'm going to India, his father said to him, are you mad? Have you lost your mind? It's not we, what we do. Church was about coming to a building, sitting in a pew, listening to, to a sermon, maybe sing a song or two and going home. That was church. William Carey said, no, church is to go out there. Served in India for 40 years. Translated the scriptures into at least 36 languages. Shoemaker. Compiled a, a many language dictionary of all the different dialects in India. Wrote grammar books so that they could understand the gospel. Studied botany to help them with their agriculture. Had a huge ministry. He's the fa father of modern missions. That's where we come from as Southern Baptists. Southern Baptists had their first convention in 1845. You know what one of the first orders of business was? We created the Foreign Mission Board. That's who we are as God's people. We're missional people is the theological term. We're on mission every moment or we should be. This is what Philip is doing. God says, Philip, I want you to leave this. I want you to go out into the desert. Scripture says, behold. That's, that's an excla exclamation of excitement. He didn't expect to see anybody out there in the desert. This is in, in the middle of nowhere. This is the middle of nowhere. God, you want me to leave this thriving ministry and go out into the middle of nowhere? Okay, I'll go. I'm sure he didn't expect much. And he goes out there and here's this the Ethiopian eunuch who's the treasury secretary for, for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. Candace was not her name. Candace is a title. Candace means ruler of serves, or ruler of servants, or prince of servants. So I know we use it as a name now, but it was simply a title. We don't know the queen's name, but she was Candace, the queen. He was in charge of all her treasury. This is a big high up muckety muck. You know, he's not just driving a chariot by himself. He's not bouncing along in a little wagon with a donkey in front of it. He's got a whole retinue of people. 
Philip comes out there, and here's this crowd of people. He said, well, behold, look at all these people. And God says, Philip, I want you to go up to the chariot. Now, that took some courage. I'm sure this man had an armed escort. He's an important man. He had made a thousand-mile journey to Jerusalem to worship God. And he gets there, and he finds out the, the priest and the Levites, he's a eunuch, he can't even get into the temple. He said, well, you know, I'm sure he was disappointed because he was seeking something. He was seeking the true God. He knew there was a true God. Maybe the tradition had been passed down from the Queen of Sheba. Ethiopia was not the small country it is nowadays. It was a larger kingdom back in those days, south of Egypt. So it was the next kingdom south of Egypt. It was a large kingdom. Maybe the Queen of Sheba had brought it back 900 years beforehand. Maybe, you know, he had been in contact with the, with the Jewish communities there in Egypt, maybe Alexandria, who knows. He had heard about God and he believed in the God, the only God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he came up to Jerusalem seeking to know more about God, seeking to worship God. And here's, here's a thought. God doesn't do things like we think he ought to. Sometimes what God does seems wasteful to us, doesn't it? The man has been in Jerusalem where the apostles are. Why didn't he send an apostle to share the gospel with him? He could have sat at the feet of John or Peter or Bartholomew, any of them. He could have shared the gospel with this Ethiopian eunuch through those apostles who were already in Jerusalem, discipled him. But he didn't. Seems like to us that's not a very efficient way to do things. We got somebody in place. Chapter 10, we see at the end of this, Philip settles in Caesarea. Where does chapter 10 take place? There's a Roman centurion in Caesarea. Philip is right there. So what does God do? Does he say, Philip, you remember what you did to the Ethiopian eunuch? I want you to go see this, this Roman centurion. No. He gives the centurion a dream, says, I want you to go find the apostle, Paul, I mean, uh, uh, the apostle Peter. Peter has to make a journey to Caesarea to share the gospel with the Roman centurion. Philip's sitting right there. Why does God do things inefficiently? I'm not going to answer that for you because I don't know. But what I am going to tell you is it doesn't matter. We're not to question God, we're to obey God. That's it. Because ultimately what this story is about is how God shares the gospel. First, God is sovereign in sharing the gospel. God had prepared that Ethiopian eunuch's heart to be riding in that chariot on that specific day reading a very specific portion of Scripture. He's reading Isaiah 50, uh, 53, verses 7 and 8. Isaiah 53, if you don't know what Isaiah 53 is, shame on you. And if you do you understand there is no better scripture in the entire Bible to share the gospel from. Turn to Isaiah 53. This was written hundreds of years before Jesus. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had, formed no, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and this is what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading when Philip came up to the chariot he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. 
by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. It cannot be describing anybody else but the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot be. It's the perfect scripture to, to begin a conversation about who Jesus is. The Ethiopian eunuch had just read, back in verse 6, we're all sinners. We've all, we've all fallen away. So he was able to share that we're all sinners, that we're all in need of God's grace, that we can't do anything on our own. After we have sinned one time, we are no longer able to commune with God because we're spiritually dead. We're sinners. Paul puts it this way in Romans. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. You see, that's what you're being measured against. You're not being, I'm not being measured against Terry. I'm not being measured against the guy that sits in the Walmart parking lot begging for money. I'm not being measured against the pedophile out there in jail. I'm not being measured against anybody on this planet. I'm being measured against the glory of Almighty God. God's got his glory on the scale on this side. He's got me, my performance, my obedience to the law on this side. You think I'm still level with God? No. I've broken every commandment God has ever given multiple times, and so have you. We cannot come up to, to, to God's glory. After we have sinned one time, we can never be perfect again. Never. We can't recreate ourselves. We can't cause ourselves to be reborn. We're hopeless. We're helpless. Paul also says, for the wages of sin, in other words, what you earn from your sin is death. Not just physical death, spiritual death. That means you spend an eternity in, outside of the presence of God. You were created with a soul that will live forever. You either exist for eternity in God's presence in heaven or you exist outside of God's presence in hell. The absence of anything beautiful and good and happy, pleasant, total misery because you're not with God. That's your option. He would have told the Ethiopian eunuch that. Because the Ethiopian eunuch asked him a very pertinent question. Who is the prophet talking about? Who is the prophet talking about? Brothers and sisters, this is how Philip shared the gospel. And this is how we, and by the way, each and every Christian ought to be able to do what Philip does here. To take any scripture, any spiritual topic, and, and preach Jesus. Because what Philip does is what's vitally important for us to do this weekend. What's vitally important for us to do as we, as we walk this earth, as we go through life, is to focus on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be able to share who Jesus is and what Jesus does. Because the most pressing question in all of humanity, all of history, is who is this book speaking about? Who is the promised seed of the woman that God gives way back in Genesis? Who is it that Abraham and Isaac are prefiguring there when God tells Abraham, sacrifice your only son? Who is it that Joseph points to when his brothers throw him in a pit and send him away from them? Who is it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire? Who is it that shuts the lion's mouth as Daniel is, is thrown into the lion's den for being faithful to God? Who permeates the entire essence of this book from in the beginning to the amen? Who? It's Jesus. John tells us in his gospel, Everything that was created was created through Jesus. When Genesis said, God spoke, let there be light, those words came from Jesus. When the scripture says that, that God reached down and formed Adam, and in Adam, you and me, from the, from the dust of the ground, it was Jesus' hands that did that. 
It was Jesus' hands that, that created the trees, created the very tree he would be nailed to. He created the animal that gave the leather for the whip that would stripe his back. He created the ore that they would fashion into those nails. He's the one that, that created that bush where they got the crown of thorns. We must make Jesus preeminent in all that we do. God has given him dominion. God the Father has given the Son judgment over all, all of creation. He has given him dominion over all of creation. Because here's the truth about evangelism. Here's the truth about what we as, as God's people should believe. If Jesus is who he said he was, Christianity is true. If he's not, we might as well do something else. Because none of it's true. And this is who Jesus said he was. This is what Philip shared with the Ethiopian eunuch. This is what we need to share with those children this weekend. This is what we need to share with our co-workers, whoever we encounter. You notice, Philip, God doesn't tell him to go back to Samaria where he has a thriving ministry. He sends him to Caesarea. Although he's not got a mandate from God after God says, go into the desert, I want you to run up to the chariot. God takes him away from the chariot, sends him up through Caesarea. He says, Philip, preach the gospel wherever he went. Wherever he went, he preached the gospel because he understood what William Carey understood, what we should understand. Our job, our primary responsibility is to share the gospel of grace with the lost and dying world. That's the problem with the church today. We don't have a concern for those people who don't know Jesus. We should be chasing them to the hospital, to their deathbeds, begging them about Jesus. If we love people like Jesus did, do you think we can keep our mouth shut? No. It drew William Carey to India. God put India on his heart. He didn't have an easy time. After 19 years, had a warehouse burned down. Lost all the work he had done up to that point. I'm sure he must have been like Philip. Why in the world, God? This ain't helpful. This ain't helpful, God. Why you do this? Look at all that I lost. Well, God used that fire that destroyed all of that work. In two months, the, the, the knowledge of his mission had grown so much. In two months, he received enough donations to complete his work. That's 21 more years. God financed 21 more years because he allowed a fire to happen. Yes, he reaccomplished all his work. But sometimes God does things we don't understand. Because let's face it, I would have been upset if my, life, if my warehouse burned down with all of my life work. But William Carey understood something else. God is sovereign and can do with us as he wishes because as God does, always, inevitably, is better than what we can come up with. God doesn't run things like an American business model. He doesn't have a focus group. He doesn't have the, the flow charts. God's way is perfect. Our job is to be obedient. It's what Philip did. It's what William Carey did. That's what we, as Unity Baptist Church, must do. We have a huge opportunity this weekend. I don't know if you've signed up to work. We can always use helpers. We plan on having a bunch of kids here. Bible school is a fun time. Bible school, believe it or not, sees more people come to Christ than any other mission we have every year. Let's pray for our vacation Bible school. Let's let God lead our vacation Bible school. And let's get serious about what our mission is. Let's take the words of William Carey, famous words. 
His last sermon he preached in England before he went overseas to India. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Let us make it our motto. Let's expect great things from God. But let's don't be afraid to attempt great things for God. Heavenly Father, thank you for these, your people. Thank you for the evangelist Philip so many years ago, Father, that shows us that the gospel is to go out to all the earth, that the gospel is, is for all of mankind, that you do love the entire world enough to send your son to die for all of us. Help us, Father, to develop a heart of missions. Help us to, to develop a heart for, for the lost, Father. We ask that you would put a burden on us. Let it just burn in our souls, Father, that we must share Jesus with all wherever we may come in contact with. Help us, Father, to always be prepared to praise his name, to extol his glory, to share his grace. We ask it in his precious and wonderful name. Amen.